Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Association for Women in Communication, the South Florida chapter. And today I'm thrilled to have um, a panel discussion about AI and communication and PR because there's a lot of uh, words out there. It's a, a lot of people talking about worrying about their job and all these different things. So I want to go ahead and set this up so I can have this more of a speaker view. And then I'm going to pin myself up and then, and then I'm going to pin Emily to, there we go. And then I'm going to give, where is my VP? There she is. Pin. Here we go. And so the three of us are the um, board of the Women Communication, the South Florida chapter. As you know, we're celebrating 114 years. We have big, apparently we have some huge news being announced on national level. They're so excited. They want to get a meeting together. So I'll let you ladies know more, but um, I'm going to go ahead and give the microphone to Terry and she's going to lead us into a breathing exercise so we can have our event. And let me double and triple check. We are recording. And again, thank you so much for everyone for being here. And let me go ahead and mute my mic and um, the mic is your Terry. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we can. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Um, wherever you are, close your eyes. And if, if you're sitting or standing or laying down, relax your face, relax your jaw, relax your neck and shoulders. Visualize the stress going down your arms, out through your fingertips. Your upper body's completely relaxed. Relax your chest, torso, hips. Visualize the stress going down your legs, out through your toes. And you're completely relaxed, keeping your eyes closed. Just gently breathe in through your nose. Hold it and exhale. Again, inhale. Exhale. One more time. Inhale. And exhale. Keeping your eyes closed, just gently breathing in and out through your nose. Visualize the air going in and out through your nose. That's all I want you to think about at this time. If any other thoughts come in your mind, just see them as clouds floating by in the sky, leaving your mind and come back to the air going in and out through your nose. Gently open your eyes. And I have closing thoughts here. A visit or a call from a friend can heal you. You can also heal a friend in the same way. Is there someone you've been wanting to contact but haven't made time? Today might be the time. Namaste. May the divine in me honor the divine in you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. So, should we go ahead and we'll get started? I'm going to 
introduce our incredible panelists today. And today I'm excited to be talking about the ways that we can transform using AI, the way that we can transform the communications industry. And we have some incredible women who are on today to talk to us about this topic. Uh, let's see, we're gonna start, got some bios of everybody here. Just one moment. All right, well, we've got Sabila Spalding, PR and communication strategist for various sectors, including technology, finance, and healthcare. Andrea Felder, an entrepreneur who's involved in multiple online endeavors, including AI hacks, caption copy, Rocket Hub, Amfluence, and more. We have Jennifer Navarrete, a Web3 evangelist, an award-winning social media community builder, and an 18-year podcaster. Yes. And, but I'm excited to have all of the other ladies here today to talk about this extremely important topic in communications. So thank you all very much for joining us. And I have a lot of questions to go over today. Um, a lot of things we want to know. Because artificial intelligence is still pretty new. I mean, it's it's prevalent. We're all using it. We're seeing it used a lot more, but it's still new. And it's already changing the way we're all doing things. And as Tanya mentioned, we got a lot of people who are worried about their jobs. They're excited about this technology for their jobs. There's a lot of different uses for it. Um, so the very first thing that I want each, you know, just kind of go around and have each one of you talk a little bit about what it is that you do and how you're using AI in your job or in your everyday, where you're seeing your use of it the most right now. Um, and let's go ahead and start with Jennifer, because I see you in my top left-hand corner here, and I'm gonna go ahead and mute and give the mic over to you. Fantastic, so as you mentioned, I'm an 18-year podcaster, and in that time, I've seen the democratization of media back in those early days of podcasting, blogging, and um, you know, video and everything else, right? All of a sudden it wasn't traditional media, it was all of us. We could create media and we could share it with the world. And then we looked at social media coming onto play where it really became something that people were really glomming onto. And that was the democratization in, in an, an entirely new way, right? It leveled the playing field. And then we look at what's going on nowadays with AI and Web3 and all of a sudden it's democratization of content, meaning all of us can do these things. There isn't just a select few. So I, as I look at this, I, I have a long history of watching as new technologies and new tools come in. As you mentioned, it's the early days and there's folks who are frightened and there's folks who are excited. There, there's folks who think the sky is falling and folks who think it's the best thing since sliced bread. And it's really neither. It could be both, but it's probably somewhere in the middle. And I love this, the fact that we have this group of women gathered together to talk about it because the reality is how does it work for us? How can we benefit from it and how can we limit what could potentially be something that could be damaging to our career or to our income or to the future? And how can we be ethical in the way that we're using this? So I'm really, when Tanya mentioned this, I was like, yes, sign me up. I want to do this because there's so much to talk about. This isn't the first conversation that folks are having about it, nor will it be the last, but we now live in the, in the age of AI folks. So if you're with your head down in the sand, come join us. Let's start dipping our toes into the water because it's a, the water may be a little chilly or it may be an unknown factor, but you're not alone in this. If we all do it together, then there's a learn, share, grow opportunity as a collaborative, as a collective, as a, as a group of communicators that can learn, share, and grow with one another. I love that because it's collaboration, not competition. And if women collaborate, we can have... Yeah, I say this all the time. I'm like, let's take over the metaverse. Let's take over all this stuff. Let's use AI to our benefit. And I know that's phenomenal. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, Andrea, how about you? How are you using AI? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, so I've been working um, in digital marketing, I guess you could classify it for you know over a decade. And my very first like meeting or encounter with the online world and content and distribution was um, blogging and Twitter and just the idea of like, you know, essentially getting your content out to the world, right? Hello world is like um, the common phrase, you know? 
Um, now, and more recently, my role has been more like operations, like essentially how can we make processes faster? Um, how can we take what we do in like a traditional agency or content de development setting and create engines around them? Um, the thing, I'm really glad that we're all here today, especially as women, and because obviously in the technical field, women are, you know, in a way less um, <laughs> less prevalent, I guess you would say, but it's so nice to have a community of women that are standing beside each other and like actually paving the way because uh, when it comes to AI, uh, we've been using AI for quite a while. GPT-4 is basically the latest release, but we've been using AI for a long time in software and most of the time, you know, we don't see it. It's not in our face, right? And I think, um, like Jennifer mentioned, the democratization of technology means now that we can all actually use it in chat form. So that makes it a lot more fun. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm really excited because I know it's going to transform the way we market um, the processes that are in place for just everyday, even freelancers, writers, um, PR people, everyone basically, that uses either design or, you know, words <laughs> to communicate. Um, it's going to change the way we do that and in the pace that we do it. So it's really exciting to see that evolution occur. And I'm really happy to be here around other women who, because actually the AI that we're encountering, it really does require a lot of empathetic um, interaction. And I think that as a woman, especially, we're very well suited in the communication field to understand that area. So really excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a great point. And I, that's something we will talk about a little bit more as well, is what's driving the AI that's out there now? And how can we how can we be a part of that? And what can we do to, to work on that as women? Um, so Sabila, you're, you're up. Tell us about yourself. Well, um, I'm currently a, a technology consultant with Microsoft. I have been in, uh, since the last five years. Uh, prior to that, I have had a, an extensive experience in various technology fields, um, web applications uh, primarily or systems for enterprises, uh, modernization transformation of uh, business processes uh, coming to digital systems and digital platforms or services. Mm -hmm. uh, I did uh, have some early experience in uh, journalism. Uh, I was uh, a radio host at one point in Bulgaria. I wrote um, articles wow. for uh, various um, gaming magazines and I covered E3 as well as worked uh, with Electronic Arts and THQ for a little bit in the beginning of my career, but I quickly transitioned to solving problems for various different industries, various different users, because it allowed me to learn how people adopt uh, technology and adapt and how we grow together with the technology. I spent early on learning a lot about the history of technology and AI. And I remember wondering what would it have been the 90s if those projects didn't get canceled back in the 50s or the earlier ages. And living through this time is kind of exciting. And yes, it could be scary. It is unknown and we get to architect our future and our uh, society, our uh, sciences and interactions with each other. So we, it's a great time to, to re-envision, I believe, but it is a, definitely something that I don't think everybody is ready at the same level at the same time. And it will take a lot of people who are, know how to communicate and how to influence uh, or how to help uh, decipher those dark, uh, 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 those dark areas that are causing the fear or that are causing uh, various concerns or it, find the solutions, create the paradoxes and counter paradoxes to uh, protect the technology and to preserve both the technology and the human interaction so we can um, have the best experiences with the least uh, um, limitations. <laughs> And thank you very much, Sabila. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of you. And um, Tanya, I don't know if you, I know you work a lot on um, AI and you've been working a lot within uh, communications overall over the years. 
I don't know if you want to jump in as well to mention kind of your background and what you've seen with the transition of this technology as well. I would love to. <laughs> no, I am, I'm really excited about the time we're living in. We're like, I, I call this the Renaissance. Um, you know, if you look back in back in the in the history, when you think of Renaissance, you think of all this stuff is happening. But now with technology and healthcare and AI, and just think how much with if we use the right tool, you know, the right prompt, how much is going to change the way we live and live longer. Um, so I mean, I had my own my taste was in 2015. I met this uh, Russian scientists, researchers. There was these two beautiful women, actually. They were like, I just couldn't believe this, what they were doing is researching. And um, I ended up hooking them up with uh, introducing uh, their their company. It was like, it's called Deep Learning. Um, they have, to, and, and where they made vitamins for life extension. So life extension has been around since 1970s. So um, they were like one of the first company and, and they're one of my clients, so full disclosure. So I, from there, I started, you know, wondering what it's like and what, you know, how it is. So now today I, I use like four AI. I'll sometime, you know, I'll, I'll forget because it's on my phone. So anything that comes up to my mind, I'm like, oh, I wonder what it's going to say about this. And, you know, I don't publish right away. I always, I feel that, you know, AI itself, you have to test it. You got to make sure it's telling you the right information and make sure you're prompting one word can change the whole thing. So um, for myself personally, I use it. I, 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 I'm obsessed with it. So as a content creator, I feel it really opens up my eyes. So now instead of just taking me three or four hours, just trying to like, A, write, publish, SEO, you know, do all the keywords and all that stuff. Now I got four stories going on at the same time and have the AI pick, pick out the picture. And then, you know, like, I'm public the story, so it's four times quicker, four times more, and it's faster for me because my brain is, you know, not, I, and I think uh, Sabila and I talk about this, the nonlinear thinker, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm not like Jennifer. Jennifer's like focused. I can listen to Jennifer and, I'm, and I follow her path. <laughs> and so are you, Emily. I'm like, Psh, but I come back the same, you know, I get where I'm supposed to go. So I feel we're living in a great time, um, but there's a lot of hesitance. So for myself personally, for someone that came from a, a luxury background who's who never really touched a computer until 2004, I feel like now we are definitely living in a renaissance. I can't wait to see what's going to be like next year. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> There we go. And I'm muted. See? Um, no, but yes, that does answer the question. Thank you. Um, so my next question is that I do think that women overall, um, in general, we have the ability right now as new technology emerges to not just dip the toes in the water, but to really jump in and to create more equality and equity within a new industry, a new technology, a new space. Um, and as I believe it was Sabela, but somebody mentioned that, you know, when we're talking about AI, it, it does need that empathetic touch. We do, there's certain, there's aspects of it where women can excel. And I want to see, does anybody want to talk about that and how you've seen as a woman, um, your unique experience working with AI and how being a woman has kind of affected that and I don't know if anybody has I'll, a I'll jump in I'll jump there in um okay. I think what happens a lot of times is that when a new technology comes out we think oh well it's the guys developing that or the guy or the men who are leading the charge with that but I can tell you as someone who was doing podcasting back in 2005 I wasn't the only woman podcasting and I know tons and tons of women who do and in web three I'm seeing a lot of women I'm in AI I'm seeing a lot of women the challenge is maybe the women aren't being seen by the broad general public so data will show that men are more active in these spaces, but it also diminishes the fact that women are blazing trails. We are totally getting the machete and looking at the jungle and hacking away and fig charting a path to making the path easier for folks behind us. I think for us as women, we need to amplify and Rose Horowitz is in this room, but we need to amplify what women are doing because it's too easy to look at all of the headlines where the men are, are doing the things. And yet there are women doing the things, but the women aren't in the headlines in the equal measure. 
So if you're someone who's not techie geeky, like obviously we are, because if you've been in this space for any amount of time, guess what? You're techie geeky and you're diving in first headlong. You're, you know, blazing those trails. You're an early adopter. You're a pioneer. And the general public, you know, we think about the wave, right? The Rogers bell curve. We're still here. We're still at the part, you know, innovation and early adopter aspect of it. And some of it, yes, has gone to mainstream. But I would say that the majority of women in general are hearing about this and think, is that wondering, is that for me? Or I don't know if that's for me. And if it's for me, in what way is it for me? So I think one of the things that we can do as women who communicate, who pioneer, who blaze trails is to continue to amplify one another, to continue to be at the forefront. The little things that we're doing that we're like, ah, who would care that I'm trying this out? No, share it, share it post it on social media, put it out there, even if it's not fully baked. Guess what? Right now, the pl the playing field is extremely level for men and women, for everyone, because this thing is coming so fast that we're all just trying to keep up. And I mean, there was one week where there was 200 different things that were announced in one week in relation to AI. Who can keep up? No one can, which is why it's really important for all of us to learn our little specialties and then come back and then we can be collaborative. And if it's competition, it's not really competition, it's co opetition because we're going to share what we've learned and then we're going to take our unique spice and flavor and go in a direction. So I think being extremely visible, even in our failings where it's like, oh, I tried this thing, that didn't work. It's a lesson learned for everyone. So don't be afraid to fumble around. Everyone's fumbling around and amplify and elevate and showcase what you're doing because the way that we're going to get there is by fumbling around. The way that we're going to encourage others who may be intimidated by this is by showing them that they can do it too. Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and Sabila, I see yeah, your yeah, hand. I don't up. just love this at all. Not at all. I'm not <laughs> enthusiastic about this in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I love yeah, it. And I I'll, can hold one when I have Sorry, go go ahead, Rose, please. Oh, um, no, I just I just uh, want to uh, amplify what what uh, Jennifer said, and uh, there was a great conversation. I did a Women to Follow Summit with uh, Jennifer and Mariah Howard, who is um, a developer and educator, and and they were talking. And one of the things I would ask all of you, maybe, and just an opposing view, but while we can use AI, right, where do we stand in terms of who's writing it? Because that was something that Mariah Howard brought up and she <clears throat> says that she sometimes re faces reverse discrimination that she's so young that, that people don't think a 30 year old can be, you know, as competent <laughs> at this as she <laughs> is. Um, but she was saying if, um, you know, the problem is that it's being written by white men and at the end of the conversation, it's very interesting. She said, you know, she encouraged all women to make sure they have like a, a male buddy because <laughs> they are doing, you know, uh, that we can learn from them and they will share and, and grow together. I mean, I think it's like 70% of people in tech are men in the field, something like that. I feel that's changing. That's changing. It's it's very slow. I just did this whole series for Intel and looked at their stats and I you know they ha I mean I think in in man in black men it didn't move at all and you know in the year that the the goal that they made and and women it was very very minimal so yes it's growing but so 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 slowly. I mean, I I'd like to add to that and maybe just address Rose's question because I'm sitting here it's it's a, a really huge topic on my mind just like actually interacting with AI. Um, and then it's funny because um, before, maybe it was yesterday morning, I was talking to an, another woman um, and she's an entrepreneur. And she said, well, just make sure your your daughters watch you on this panel, right? At the recording or something. And I said, I appreciated that because there are so few women in tech or the confidence to be in a technical field as a woman is something that needs to be developed, um, especially at a young age, right? So my mother, she was a teacher for about, you know, 38 years and I'm not a teacher, <laughs> but I, you know, I would love to teach other people, but I mean, I just admire the profession in general. Um, but through my interaction with AI, I started to realize that there's a lot of like discrepancies and 
for example, okay, I'll just give you an example. My son and I we were working on a science project and I said, let's do something related to chat GPT since it's actually happening this year and you can use it and you can just demonstrate your thought process. And um, if you all want to look at it, it's just a spreadsheet, but it uses um, GPT and sheets and it said bit.ly forward slash college GPT. So he did that with me over the weekend. And as we were training this GPT to like just come up with weighted weighted models for what college recommendations, et cetera, um, uh, we develop like different criteria. For example, the, your race, um, your religion. So after a few like inquiries, right, it started returning responses. And then interestingly, after maybe the fifth or sixth inquiry, it said, you know, race and religion aren't necessarily things you should base your college decisions on. So we're not going to include that in the recommendations. So this is like they're filtering. Sylvia is laughing because I think she understands that it's kind of like stopping us from like empathetically understanding these are the decisions we should be making. And certain people have certain criteria and that's okay, right? Um, so if I wanted to go to an all black college because my son is African-American, I might want those recommendations. But for some reason, our current culture is kind of like guarding that, right? Um, but then in other experiments, for example, in mid-journey, when you're saying something like, um, you may want the uh, AI to return um, an image of like an Indian American man, right? What happens is you'll get an Indian man with kind of, you know, just I just the typical Indian man, but you can't, you're not looking for that. So race and description is kind of like a problem, right? We're looking for an Indian man who maybe is living in New Jersey not the Indian man traditionally in India, right? So it's so funny that there's a lot of these like racial biases um, that actually are occurring within this technology because it's kind of whoever's programming the neural network is also determining what we're getting in response. So if women are not involved and different races are not involved in like the programming of these neural networks, it's going to be one-sided, um, very heavily one-sided. That's just my opinion, but yeah through experience and observation. If as a as a journalist, you know, if I look at who's being quoted in, in the press about AI, mm -hmm. the only woman I can, you know, prominently think about is Kara Swisher. But otherwise, you know, I mean, and she's commenting on the men who, you know, are building AI, but <laughs> there's no one really, you know, out there to say, I'm a woman, I'm involved in, in creating ChatGPT, and I'm going to make sure that it's, it's diverse and, and women are, are represented, but, you know, that's a real problem. It seems to me like if in mid journey, you, you know, or, you know, everything is, um, I mean, they, they give you some, it's what um, Mariah said at our, at my summit, she said, okay, well, if I'm a 35 year old, half, you know, Hispanic, half black woman who's 145 pounds and five, six um, and living in X, Y, Z, you know, what is AI going to tell me? Okay. Are they going to know how to look at that person? Um, that perspective is probably going to be highly skewed by the network. Um, and I know Sylvia has been deep into like the programming aspect of it. So I'd prefer her to speak on that. But I just would say it's heavily biased uh, based on who um, developed it. Well, uh... I think some of it is not only um, who developed it, but also the data that is being fed and also the various uh, value systems that we have created, be that that uh, enterprises, corporate, or in the educational system or in uh, society in general. It seems that uh, uh, you could look at various applications, not only AI, you could look at uh, how social media chooses to um, um, control or uh, to manage their users is very different than what we have learned in, from game development and game games. If you if you if you took those approaches in games, you normally you, you wouldn't uh, survive very long. You wouldn't have a game that lasts for decades, like World of Warcraft or others. So uh, there are quite a lot of different aspects that uh, the bias uh, could be both inherited or perceived based on usage, based on data set, based on filters that are implemented on top, which is necessarily doesn't mean 
uh, is trained into the model, but it is a security uh, policy or security filter on top that allows you or protects uh, certain types of behavior because those tools can be very powerful and you don't want uh, uh, younger or more, uh, or you don't want uh, people who can uh, switch different contexts, mean one thing, be uh, get something else, uh, have various uh, different side effects happen because of it. Uh, there's various contexts that are correct in, in each meaning. And Andre, uh, you, um, you showed one of those examples. They're both correct, but because of the time or the space and because of the intent of the user, actually, the result was not necessarily the best. Now, we can choose to accept that maybe the problems that we come up with, uh, they are not going to be always the best, that we have to learn how to communicate better what our intent is to receive, perhaps uh, explain better to the model what you uh, were trying to get. But at the same time, there are certain things that are put in place to protect, and I think they might actually cause more damage because they are giving the perception of bias when it's actually a um, moderation. There's other better ways to solve the problems that we're having, I believe, but when it comes to also the early adoption of the technology, the learning how to communicate with those uh, uh, systems, this is going to be a little bit of a adjustment uh, period for both the industry, the solutions, the interfaces, because we envision a new type of communication we are mixing context uh, on both uh, the model and on the user side and in the communication. That's three different places where something might be left out or go wrong. And in this case as well, you might not be uh, aware of how you might sound to the model. Uh, sometimes we forget how we actually uh, come through, even for the people who we communicate. And I, I I often say that if you were that good of prompt engineers, we would have had much easier time communicating with each other, with our parents or with our kids or with uh, coworkers. And that's not necessarily the case because we all have different personalities. We all have different types of um, experiences and our interactions with uh, machines or humans depend on also where we're coming from and how we're feeling if we are at uh, our best or uh, if we are stressed or any other aspect so you one day you could read something and see it one way and another day you could see it as something else without that text even changing now add the the complexity of the having the same kind of um operation on the other end, uh, just like a human, but not quiet and missing your experiences or missing its own experiences. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's up to us to provide that context for the model. And again, I don't know if, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we have the best solutions, but I think everybody's working to find the best. And as far as who works on those models, I can tell you, I have jumped in a lot of different um, meetings, be, be that responsible AI or open AI uh, um, meetings that are internal or external. And I remember talking with quite a lot of ladies and I have worked with quite a few of them as well. Uh, Dr. Lisa um, is one of the people that I can think of who is working on PhD in AI. Uh, I have worked with uh, a number of other uh, people as well on uh, various aspects of it as well, not only the, uh, the, the development, but also the user interactions and before Microsoft as well as in Microsoft, I was more on the DevOps and uh, other aspects of it, but I, I wasn't part of the developing of the, 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 the technology. I was part of uh, implementing that technology at uh, places where it was needed at enterprises. And it was very different than uh, this kind of experience because at that point you create something and you you bring it to to uh, a life and then somebody else takes uh, afterwards and they train and they do all the other aspects so uh, there's various different areas that various different product groups various different uh, uh, entities and quite a lot of females do work in that uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that technology the problem however is because of how many 
various uh, layers they are or um, uh, groups or technology aspects it does become hard to give the visibility to everybody so it becomes one of those uh, everybody uh, goes to the top and whoever is the spokesperson of the technology or of the company or the um, we we tend to society tends to choose our own leaders i believe you can see elon musk is one of those examples uh, even when others uh, might not be necessarily following him we are looking up to him for some kind of uh, uh, direction or some kind of uh, uh, feedback to see to to evaluate what's happening in other aspects so you always have this uh, uh, two sides uh, that are uh, the the more um, the earlier developers or the uh, late developers or the more conservative, more liberal, or the more uh, abstract or the more concrete thinkers. So we always have this duality of types of uh, uh, thinking and we always choose our leaders based on who we relate to the most. And that's, that's achieved through influence. That's achieved through being able to communicate your values. And uh, that's not available to everybody because um, the stage is not uh, big enough and there's not enough time, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope that helps, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy, uh, happy to uh, go back into more uh, detail. It, you know, I really love about you, um, Sabila, is that you, you t keep tagging Elon because he wanted a VP. <laughs> he, he's looking for a VP. At, what was, how do you say he, in PR? And that, that was so that, that was so <laughs> interesting because we scheduled this meeting about uh, a month and a half ago and just two days he's like I need a VP of PR I'm like what are the chances like and it's just like two days before the meeting too. That's why I'm saying like if you become the P the VP of PR, <laughs> just remember us. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, of I'm, course, I wanna, yeah. I want to touch base. I, I do believe that you're you're right. It, it's also depending who writes it. I mean, I remember putting on my first goggle in 2015 for VR, and I was just kind of like irritated because everything was made because of the men. It was like they're the one that was getting into it. But then now there's a lot of um, builders and developers or women that are creating beautiful AR and VR environment. I mean, that's going to be our next month's um, education class. And hopefully we'll be in, in um, we'll probably be in another environment, but um, that it'll work better. But then the one we have today, but I, I feel like, you know, it's going to take time and, and like everything else too. Like, for example, when, when, you, when we used to do a lot of top stuff on Facebook, and when I used to upload pictures of all of us at the Boca Resort, the blue, and just a bunch of women just stand up being proud of who we are, we're women, right? With pose and picture, Facebook would take it down and say that we went against our um, community standard. And so then, I, and then I realized, so it depends where who's watching over our stuff. What part of the what country are they in? You know, that's the other thing. So now, fast forward, when it comes to AI, you're right. It depends who, who's writing it, but. I feel like because they have that this whole open, you know, API thing going on, you have like every day, I don't know about you guys, there's like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 new ones. And, you know, like I kind of I have a, like if you want you want me to share with you, I am I literally have bookmarked. I have a whole it's it's overflowing actually of all these different com different new companies and mm -hmm. different things they're doing. So I feel like you know, and technology is going so fast. I think it's gonna, we gonna and the women women we will be. I feel and and they have said this already, Jennifer. I don't know you you stop me on that, but I feel that Web three when it comes to all the digital and being able to multitask and creating, I feel like women it's it's a calling. I mean, I I just started a, a construction company. You know, I'm not, I'm not lifting anything, but I'm starting a metaverse construction company. You know, when I tell people that and. I never thought I would do that. I never, not once, but now I can because of the technology has caught up and the opportunities there. So, and, and I feel like, you know, that's why we're always trying to feature these dynamic women. And if you come across with any, just let us know. Um, again, you know, it, more women talking about other women, bringing them up is the key. That's what we want. We want to have more stories, more things. So that's why we, we, um, curated this in, in a way that 
when when the final pr um, product is done, you'll see it's not just one video. It'll be like different parts of videos of, of you ladies, each one of you speaking. And then that, that's more SEO for you. So this one, when someone searches, they see you. So I, again, you know, I, I think that's where we as a, a community, we're going to do something together. We do it together. And and I'm, I'm never worried about other people. You know, like Jennifer, we, we talk, and, and Emily too, we're from the social media club family. You know, we're like, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you care, you share. So, yep. and that's sure. all. If you get it, share it. Share it, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think yeah. it's you know, the same thing for us. So I, I look mm -hmm. forward to more to come. So Emily, I'm going to give you back the mic. I know you have lots of questions. Yeah, we, so Tanya, you actually brought up a point of how like base, you know, AI has really revolutionized what it is that you've been working on technology overall revolutionizing it. I come from the world of PR and marketing. It has definitely changed what we're working on writing and ad targeting, like in, in incredible ways and content creation and all of that. Um, I even the other day, just, you know, I like the prompts of like, what are some publicity stunts we can do some unique videos. Like it comes up with all these ideas where I'm like, I never would have thought of that. And I would have spent hours brainstorming with my team to come up with what, you know, you can prompt in a minute. So um, I really want to know how this technology has changed what you're working on. Um, each one of you, like how have you seen it kind of change the face of content creation, change the face of media, change the face of, of what you're working on? Um, what is, what's the biggest impact you've seen it have for you? Um, I'll jump in on that because I think one of the things I saw really early on, because we've been playing in this space since, you know, mid last year. Right. And all, and, and, and just in general, in, in general, then all of a sudden when November rolled around, it was like, Whoa, you know, it's like this big rush of overwhelm of fire hose. And there's a lot of us that are, are doing that poking around going, I did this, I did that. What about this? What about that? What I looked at that that I wasn't really interested in, and this is something if you're a communicator or you're a woman who's thinking about delving into the space or you don't know where to go, um, or you're feeling like, oh, well, if I prompt something and Jennifer prompts something and it's the same exact sentence and we get the same exact, exact result and then I push it out there, then you know what, what's that? Yeah, you don't want to do that. That's word salad. So what the way that I looked at chat GPT or AI in general is that it's like a second brain. And the way I looked at it as far as content creation goes was like, I've been writing content online for like a really long time. My body of work is out there, lots of stuff, social media, blogs, all kinds of stuff. And I know that the ChatGPT um, uh, is up till, you know, September of 2021. And even then I wasn't like, well, I still have like a lot of years of content. So I really looked at using it as a way to farm my own content. I wasn't really interested in anyone else's content, but I've written and we've all created lots of amazing content over the years. Every once in a while, I'll go, I'll find something that I wrote like 10 years ago. And I'm like, Hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was really insightful. I really knew what I was talking about back then because we forget because we're, if you're a creator and especially if you're in PR and communications, you're creating all the time for yourself, for your clients, for your organizations. I mean, your, your mind is like click, click, click all the time. And it's easy to forget the amazing content you've written in the past in order to repurpose your content or reframe it. So when I look at the value that something like a G GPT-4 can offer me, or anything else, Bard, Bing Chat, anything else, those types of tools can offer me. It's really as a way to mine my own content, to finesse what I've already written, to really make what I'm doing better, to be a second brain, to be a research assistant, more so than me going, here's a one sentence prompt, write a 500 word or a thousand word blog post and then copy paste. That's not a good practice. And that's not something I think that is an ethical way to use it. Um, you may think differently, let's have a discussion about it. But I think if we look at this as communicators, as content creators, as people who are leaders and in, in our industry, in our fields, that if we look at it as a second brain and as a way to mine our own content, we'd be amazed. There's also the aspect of uh, copyright. If something starts with AI, it's not copywritten. But if you take your content, if I take my blog posts and I take things I've written and I start with that, 
if it was created by a human and I simply use the AI as an assistant, as a second brain, as a way to maybe create, you know, here's my blog post, um, create 10 tweets from that, you know, or do this or do that. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can fast track our workflow so that we can spend more time in our zone of genius. And that's really critical, right? Because AI is not going to replace us because there's things that we come up with that somebody has to train the AI. So we still have to create and we still have to innovate and we still have to do those things because then guess what? We train the AI. AI. So the AI is in a rearview mirror always, we as human beings. So I think for the sky is falling folks, rephrasing or reframing or rethinking how it can actually be an assistant or a second brain or a way to look at your body of work already that's out there and repurpose it and reframe it. It's powerful. It's really powerful. Is it the best thing since sliced bread? No. Is it? Is it? Is the sky falling? No. But we get to decide what that's going to be. And I love um, what Sabila was saying in reference to that there are women in these spaces, but but they're doing the work, and there isn't anybody amplifying them. That's what we need to do. The people she mentioned, I'm like, who are those people? I'm going to go look them up and follow them. I want to learn about what they're doing. And when they post something, I want to amplify what they're doing because they are the innovators in the AI space. We're going to have to be proactive as women in these early adopter fields to elevate one another in order to make sure that the general public at large knows that, yeah, women are doing this too. Yeah, and that's why I started what I started to do after hours. Uh, I almost have two jobs now because I have my client work that is not related to that. Uh, maybe hopefully soon would be. But uh, I also have the community and I have all my coworkers who some of them were left out with no uh, jobs after uh, massive layoffs of our uh, our crowd and AI or our product groups also got impacted. And not only in Microsoft, also in our other uh, big organizations. And as a result, there's a lot of people who are very actively looking for various opportunities or who have not had any kind of visibility because they have been behind the scenes for so long that people didn't even know that they exist. So. I have been trying to do my best ever since I uh, I helped uh, Dr. Liz. Uh, she's working on her. I call her Dr. Liz because you know she's going to get it. She's on the last mile, and I'm holding. I I reviewed her um, uh, case studies uh, over sixty for profit AI studies that she went and reviewed and uh, did dissertation on that she's finishing now. And uh, I believe that uh, we need to help uh, each generation that is coming in or those who are working towards uh, changing various fields or working towards getting that visibility. She has a blog and there are others as well. If you follow me, I, I have been uh, trying to expose and give as much uh, uh, spotlight to various different opportunities and people as well as uh, community efforts. I have a link tree that currently you'll be able to uh, go to my Twitter and just view the link tree and you will find Dr. Lisa uh, Vogue in there. You will find others, you'll find as well as JD and um, all sorts of various, uh, both AI or Web3 or security initiatives of those people who are trying to contribute because we are trying to learn together the same way everybody else is. And I created, for example, a Discord server that uh, is to test bots and you can go and currently use your mid-journey um, subscription to do various things to to practice with Midjourney, to practice with Bully, Willow. We, we have uh, five or six uh, bots currently, and we are planning to add on more. Every time I see a various community bot that is generative AI based, uh, I bring it in, we test them. We have a community who contributes to uh, cybersecurity testing and trying to break them. I interrogate them. I also get users to learn how to find the various um, tools or the various resources that they need, be that in Discord or GitHub. And all this is to, to help us grow together. And I saw today in my lunch break, I jumped in on LinkedIn and I, and I noticed a uh, .NET uh, OpenAI uh, live podcast, and they had done the same thing, but they had done the GitHub repository and the get together and then create standards. I believe this is how the community unites. This is how in the times that we currently have that we were, there might not necessarily be uh, positions uh, 
everywhere for everybody, we could come up and create the things that are working, but the things that uh, people are um, falling behind because of uh, priority or because of shift in, um, in budgets or other various things, I believe this is how we can feel that uh, contribution, even if uh, maybe we're not in our best uh, situation, be that at home or at work or in school, if you, you have some place where you can learn and where you can adapt and where you can uh, feel like you're contributing to the greater good, even if uh, you have to hide behind the scenes in your, uh, in your professional life. It's so funny that you say that, Savili, because most of the time we are actually doing the work, going behind the scenes, testing the things. Um, it, it's really funny because I, I don't see a lot of those people talking just because we're so busy doing that, you know? Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> doing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, you know, I, I just want to circle back to like the things that I think there's maybe some people who listen in and wonder like how can everyday people in marketing and communications, if you can't run command line and you can't build a bot, like how do you test AI in your workflow, right? I mean, you can, everyone can learn, but there's a lot of tools out there that are already existing that um, I know that I use or we're constantly always testing at Rocket Hub. Um, uh, last year, we launched a product with some founders. It's Eli. It's kind of like um, an AI pot, AI um, avatar type plat uh, video platform. You know, it was one of the first three, similar to Synthesia, but it's Eli, right? And so um, it was really innovative because very few products actually did the presenter AI based AI in video, video to text. So as a marketer, you can use video to tech the AI now to actually have a presenter before you without you being on video. Um, and you can even create AI in your own likeness, right? So that's really interesting. It's fun for marketers. And then um, I don't know if Jennifer would like this, but <laughs> um, there's AI voice, text to voice for podcasters now. So you don't have to use your real voice because uh, Microsoft uh, Azure has a bunch of different voices in there that sound very human-like. Um, so if you're averse to like speaking, um, you can just turn your words into a podcast uh, without actually using your voice uh, with AI, which is very fun. Uh, so there's a lot of tools out there. And like um, Kanye said, there's a million coming up and constantly bookmarking them and testing them, which makes the day busy, but mm -hmm. so much out there to test and have fun with. And I keep on going back to tools because it's a, I call it the no 3.0 problem. It, it, it's so much and they're so spread mm -hmm. out that it's almost hard to keep a track and you might lose or miss something that might be great. And it, it, it is exciting to learn also how to use them and how the similarities are in between. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I use, uh, a, a quick hack, um, I had the exercise from a, a cognitive uh, therapy type of uh, uh, um, speaking opportunity where the speaker on uh, TED Talks had asked uh, everybody to write a list of other things that they have done or created or been or even the smallest that they showed any interest and invest any kind of time just to show how they have changed their um, focus from year to year, from thing to thing, from idea to idea. And I have been working on quite some things uh, that I, I was just busy, didn't have much time. But um, after hours uh, in the middle of a conversation in the space, I was thinking everybody in the room had an Avengers name and I didn't. So I was like, huh, I wonder if I was an Avenger, who I would have been? So I went and asked ChatGPT to tell me, um, based on previous conversation I had had in career track, uh, who I would be, it said that it didn't have enough information, but I asked it to ask me the things that it needed to know. It gave me five uh, uh, questions and I answered the first one just with the list of things that I had done. And that alone, I didn't answer any of the other questions, just the first, I gave it the list. I didn't even probably adhere to, to the question quite, I just that said, this is me. And 
from that alone, it was able to give a uh, rather very good uh, profile. And I, I and uh, the first uh, the first attempt, of course, uh, it, it said Spider Man, but this was on me. I didn't say I was a female. I didn't say that I was a foreign <laughs> female. So as, as soon as I said that I was um, a Sibiu and a female, it was like, okay, yeah, the, you're definitely Natasha, which is uh, what my husband has also kind of uh, eluded because of the accent and the multiple languages and various skills but this showed me how how actually uh how little it needs in order to be mm. to, because it, it almost sounded like it didn't a lot I, it, I if i didn't push that extra prompt i could have been like ah it's too late for me to be doing a mbti mm -hmm. test right now or like how oh, those things are usually so much because you have to think from different point of view no I just gave it this uh, little piece about me and I, uh, to your point exactly, we have had this um, public appearance that we have kept public for a reason. This is our, um, this is our uh, contribution to the community and to the technology. Some of us could have been a little bit too early or maybe they didn't cause enough frame codes because it, the people were not paying attention. But now with this technology, we could come and adjust it to 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 target and to get the, the visibility or to get the um the influence or even the feedback that we seek. Often we do it to get feedback from the users so we can improve the technology as well. So I think uh, I, I think very uh, various ways of using it uh, to create and to only learn about yourself as well and how you collaborate with others. If you, uh, I've, I've used it to um, uh, check if I understood the response uh, correctly to something I had posted on Twitter. Uh, I, I have used it also to um, tailor my messaging when dealing with uh, somebody who is highly technical versus somebody who is security oriented versus somebody who is executive. On the same topic, I wrote the topic and what I want to discuss, but I needed to see how to change my delivery better uh, from that uh, dyslexic mind and ADHD uh, watch text to, to compartmentalize it and to, to, to make it just just enough for the people that I'm talking to, which I, I sometimes just felt do. Well, that's like okay. a second brain, right? That's that's what yeah, I love. Because exactly. yeah. it's yeah. me originating it, but I want that perspective to just kind of be that someone to bounce ideas off of. And I will tell you that when I've done some work and I'll be like, I, I'll ask it, okay, I'm doing this and these are my goals. And so I, I could put what I've written. These are my goals. Does this accomplish those goals? And it, it'll tell me what I've done. Like, here's where you did it. Here's where it did that. And then I'll say, so overall, yes, good job. It is the craziest thing. It telling me good job <laughs> makes me feel good. <laughs> It's so crazy. Yeah, I'm like, how is... do I feel better? Because it said I did a good job. It was like, you know, the little mm -hmm. pat on the head or the thumbs up from a AI. It's like the goofiest thing. And this is how you know that it's being trained based on um, actually science and cognitive sciences and human development or communication type of uh, patterns and not so much on who is training it. Because I can tell you, they, there aren't people who can train something like that with their own knowledge. They, they can define the various uh, points from my training, but definitely with uh, the rise of uh, adoption, we are going to see that these models are being trained on everybody's knowledge. And it becomes important to also uh, to have this context uh, where we can agree that we have always created and innovated and had fiction and science and we had facts and we had folklore, we had personal beliefs, myths, all those things, they're great. They're, they're part of envisioning and creation and innovation. We can't just say from now on, it's our facts or nothing because then we'll become this gray society where there's no pleasure to innovate. There, there wouldn't be usage. There wouldn't be people wanting to be online because everything will be so constricted. And when it is, when you don't get that part of, and you uh, fear that everything you write might be actually the opposite of the good job, uh, it's actually, oh, bad girl. Like, But I didn't mean it. Like At this point, we have to essentially come up with a 
uh, way to um, compartmentalize and say, hey, we're going to have a big pool for scientific uh, consensus data. We're going to have big pool for the kids to play and that is safe so kids can play. We're going to have a big pool for the adults who want to be able, because this, this is another topic that I think might come back to bite us right now because of um, purity or because of uh, moral standards and other aspects, certain things like nudity is not okay. But in anatomy and in, in the health books and in, uh, uh, the, in the experiences in medicine, you need to be able to showcase things the, the way they are right. and not the chopped up version. So we have to train the models as well to be able to, to be anatomically um, accurate or to be, uh, and at the same time, we don't want this to bore in with uh, kids' data. So there's definitely a way to uh, re-envision how we, how we balance um, and how we do data and collaboration. So uh, we don't limit our innovation and we don't limit our knowledge. Uh, we. I think we have lost so much to space and time because somebody had always been the gatekeeper of what gets uh, mm -hmm. printed or what gets uh, pulled down in stone. Or, uh, I, and I believe that uh, we can only grow stronger if we start um, allowing to to, to see diff different things that we might not agree with or different perspective and say, hey, our information has value. It just has value for different things. It's about how you use it or what you use that information or in which cases it's, it's being accessible as well. So I think all these aspects can um, greatly also reduce the, the frictions that we're seeing in adoption because a lot of it is because of... Uh, um, uh, fears of what will happen if everything comes to one collision point and uh, there's just uh, no uh, no way of oversight or no control, I guess. Uh, this is what I, I think people fear. And I believe there is always a way to engineer those systems and they have been engineered to, to do have this governance and oversight or separation of concerns even. So uh, a single responsibility is the next thing that comes to mind. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, so, I think to, um, I want to open I'm sorry. I also say like, I really don't have, I have never sit around and play with my AI. I just kind of like get up and make it work. <laughs> I never really wanted to teach me anything. And then now I'm I'm actually in the process of you getting another AI that makes the uh, words to videos. So I'm taking my old stories from my uh, magazine website. I'm converting that and, and doing what Jennifer said, you know, revamping, reusing my old content and then adding to it. But um, Emily, we have about 6.44 and I know- Yep, I was actually gonna <laughs> jump in to say, we actually have questions uh, from some of the listeners. So I wanna jump into some of those as well. Um, and Andrea, we'll go right back to you as well because I know you wanted to um, make a statement as well. But um, one of the questions that came in from Rose, I think is a great one, which is Jennifer had mentioned about the marketing AI show and Rose has been listening to the marketing AI show and learning from that. And she had asked, what are some other resources about AI that people should know about, that where they can learn, where they can kind of dip a toe in the water? Where should somebody start? Who should they be listening to? Um, we'd love to just get some resources from each one of you of what you would recommend. And let's start with Andrea. Oh, well, uh, first I'm just gonna say, you know, uh, what Sevilia said earlier about just Make it, keeping it open is very important. And I think that's one of um, OpenAI's strategy is to get all these users in chat PPT to actually get them to use it. And that also helps increase like the variety of people actually using the content and those inputs. But in terms of the resources to use um, to learn AI, there's a whole bunch on there. I would say follow, especially like the founders of OpenAI, the founders of all these newsletter writers, for example, I know Sylvia, myself, Jennifer, Rose, I mean, I'm like, I'm sure we are all on top of it. Um, but on other other fronts, you can go to Product Hunt because Product Hunt releases a lot of like AI launches. It's fine. You can find new software there and just play around with it um, and join the little communities that are like, especially in Discord, um, that talk about actually it's using AI and developing new technologies or around certain models. That's where I go. And Twitter, 
so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. AI yeah. Twitter for sure and, and all yeah. the good stuff. So I, I would say the, the AI, the marketing AI show is definitely a good one because they actually have been in the AI space for a really long time. They do the Mako um, conference. Um, and now, of course, they, they're, they're even more prevalent. And they just did an AI for writers. And I think this week they're doing an AI for marketers. And those are kind of free things going into paid things. But there's also one called the Chat GPT podcast, which is like a 10-minute podcast where a couple of, of guys just kind of recap the news really quickly. So if you're like, I don't really have a lot of time because the marketing AI show is long. There's also a couple of video channels that I watch that they break down. Like, here's all the news that happened this week. And there's a Twitter space on Fridays, every Friday and I, right now it escapes me, um, but there's a group of folks who come together every Friday and they just recap the news for the week and they talk about their own thoughts on it. And of course they bring up people um, up on stage to talk and I find those helpful. Again, um, when I start learning something, I go into sponge mode. And what I realized over the past month is that I don't have enough sponge to mm -hmm. soak up all the AI knowledge. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna reiterate that all of us are soaking up AI knowledge in our own way. The real key is to get back together and share what we've learned. It may not be applicable to all of us, but you're saving us all time by us gathering together to kind of recap and say, hey, I just learned this new thing. Oh, really, how did it work? Oh, here's how it worked, cool. And I think that's going to be the real key to success because to try and have a big enough sponge to take on the overwhelm of the AI fire hose, it's not possible. There's not enough hours in the day. And all of us are doing other things beyond just soaking up the AI knowledge. Uh, to, and then to kind of go into this, I think the key thing here about using AI, because I know we're wrapping up, is to know not to use proprietary stuff. I mean, there's a huge thing. Samsung, three of their engineers actually put proprietary Samsung IP intellectual property into chat, in, into you know AI. I think it was GPT-4. Now, the Samsung had given them permission to use it to kind of fast track some other stuff, but not permission to use their proprietary stuff. So now all of a sudden, something that is their intellectual property is inside of chat GPT or GPT-4. And now it's like, holy cow, you've got to be careful, folks. Your proprietary stuff, don't put it in there. Even if you're paying the 20 bucks for GPT-4, it's an it's an AI. I mean, it's an open API, right? So use the API to create your own thing. Bloomberg created the Bloomberg you know, uh, GPT or finance GPT. They're using the API in order to take their proprietary stuff, which is a lot and it's huge, to create something that's f finesse that they can sell to the people who buy their Bloomberg terminals and people in the financial industry. So there is a way to use the absolute wonder and power of it if you're in an industry that does have intellectual property or that has things that are really kind of that top secret stuff without allowing it to be given away to the world. So just be mindful of that, of how you're using it, that it's all brand new and we're all learning. We're all, you know, failing fast and we're all, you know, succeeding quickly, but it's just so new for every single one of us. So as you learn things like, Ooh, I don't want to do that. Share what you've heard or what you did or what you've learned so that we can all fast track our knowledge and go, Oh yeah, I know not to do that because Samsung just did it. Let's not do that. Um, so those are the kinds of things I think that we can do to help one another just learn quicker. Thank you. And um, let's see, we have, we have a few other questions in here and I know we've got about 10 minutes, um, but we've got a question from Tirza about um, as AI advances and a big challenge being creating more opportunity for women to shape the next generation of technology, uh, therefore being able to stop stereotypes from being perpetuated and so forth. Um, what are some strategies based on your experiences that can create some more opportunity for women? So how do we how do we get more women into into the industry and jump in, and jump in, okay. right? Uh, yeah, there's like so. For example, we're looking at even spatial, right? You there's everything is free now. I just want to like point that out. Like all the information in this vast planet is free to learn. Right. So um, you want to go to spatial and you create your like web three environment, you can do that by going to learn Unity, which is all free. So if you wanted to actually jump in and do the coding yourself, you can learn it for free. Um, and like there's no nothing stopping you. There's no nothing wrong in tech. When it breaks, it's broken. You just try and move on, you do some 
something else. Um, and if someone doesn't like it, that's better because then you have someone who has like a really opposite or opposing view of what you're doing. And so you must be hitting, there must be the, um, you know, the counterpart, right? So it's a lot of fun to just kind of take it from like the Montessori perspective of just try and fail and try and fail. And like, I think everyone has been saying, share more of what you're doing. So I don't think it's hard. Like I, the, um, ladies and gentlemen, whoever's watching, like I'm from nowhere, the middle of like, I mean, I was in America, whatever, but um, I'm in an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you can do basically anything from anywhere. So you don't have any constraints these days. You can really just pick up the laptop or use your phone and start from there. You know, especially if you're a woman, you can, <laughs> there's so many conversations about that, but at the end of the day, code and data is kind of like, it has no gender in a sense, right? Because <laughs> your thinking process can be a, a little like different based on like what you're doing, but, or who you are as a person, but it's not necessarily code and data. It just doesn't tell a lie. It doesn't tell if you're a man or a woman. It just does what you tell it to do. <laughs> and that's the fun part about it. So, you know, just go and do it. You know, don't be afraid. Like, there can be no mistake. Didn't it. Elon mention something about, um, was it uh, uh, fashion design using AI to, to um, didn't he talk about that last night? And he said, <laughs> I, I remember mm -hmm. talking about it. I, I mean, I, I listened to the replay. I didn't get a chance to listen when he was live, but that he mentioned that they're using AI to create fashion. And I, you yeah. know, again, I never thought of that. <laughs> I mean, I know you and could, he, but I never thought about it. What's interesting is he also mentioned it's like, you know, I mean, I guess from the perspective of like Twitter verification or whatnot, but he also mentioned, you know, distinguishing between what is real and what isn't real is becoming harder and harder. Right. And so if we kind of explore the ideas of like what every organization has been trying to do, verify someone's identity, or if you find like a unique problem in society that AI can solve and you just go tap into it, there's so many resources and people that are willing to help give you the answers for free. Like I found that um, most of the time in the tech space, since we're talking about like proprietary rights, right? A lot of people, especially founders who have a lot of like experience they're not averse to like giving you advice and telling you where to go. And a lot of the code is like open source. You know, I just don't think that they're, because at this stage, everyone's trying to see what's going to happen. <laughs> right. So if you can figure it out or do something unique, that's exciting. Right. So, this is awesome. well, so that brings us to our last, I think probably question that we'll be able to get um, to, but. I um, wanted to chime in if uh, I may. Uh, so one of those things that the, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind here as well as uh, you could ask ChatGPT to teach you anything that you want. If you want to teach you how to develop the model, you can ask it, okay, I want to develop this specific thing, uh, this model that it will be used in such way. For example, I would like to create a, a Susan Galvin uh, AI model that is going to be used to uh, analyze other models or to make them uh, secure or to fix if they are in a logical fallacy or if somebody exposed information that needs to be removed, uh, the bot will be able to influence that information and clean up or otherwise uh, into intervene and essentially improve how the uh, both the users and the uh, other models uh, work or collaborate together, create interfaces between the two, create resolutions when there's issues, uh, troubleshooting and debugging, uh, give visibility to the processes, to the user and some power. How do I do it? And ChatGPT is going to help you uh, design it, you can tell it, give me from the first principle, uh, give me details, give me down to the system design. If it uh, reaches to a specific point, say continue, say, okay, I, I don't know how to do this, please help me learn then it will help you go and learn that. So it will help you develop code, it will help you develop the skills, the soft skills, the, the, the big uh, a high level skill set that you need to get uh, involved and then bring you to the lower level as you are ready. So I think this is very, uh, very 
powerful thing that most people don't realize they can do it. And they can do it with uh, coding or with art or with uh, finances or even with uh, how they find the right representation and legal advice for business processes. How do I start a company? Or how do I start an open source project? How do I join an open source project? I think all these things uh, will be able to um, also build a lot of uh, was a lot longer lasting skills because uh, the user is going to experience the learning, uh, the, the quest of learning by themselves is not just fed to them where they need to just take on all this information and coming from all these uh, different uh, mediums that they are tuned to, be that uh, uh, things that they watch or the things that they read or things that they study on their own. So I think it allows you to, to, to get your information in a way that it's more meaningful to you and uh, that you can relate so you can use it better. Holy cow, you just gave us all a project to do. And I, I'd love to to challenge all of us to just do exactly what Samina just said. And let's just go, let's make this happen. Let's do the thing and do it in public. Let's build in public and see what happens. And we're gonna learn. Sabila, that was genius. That was like the mic drop moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I already have started. Goodness, I, have I don't have the white paper. So I, uh, you're I, welcome to join me, ladies. I'd love to be a part of that if you, uh, but I don't know how to code. So, oh, yeah, we <laughs> soon there wouldn't be code, most likely. Mark my words, I, I think in the next five years, the code will be obsolete uh, for the most part. No. I mean, like, you know, it's funny that you said that, Sabila, because it's for as a learning tool that structure, I think that's going to be the most like important thing that mm. we start addressing is that for the future, we really need to teach our children, the younger generation, people who are going to be like basically the future, right? Myself too, <laughs> everyone, right? We need to teach ourselves to be curious. Um, just, I, I mean, I, I know I mentioned earlier, but I, I, I'm making my children sit down in front of it. And at first they're scared, right? They're like, I don't know how to code. And I'm like, just don't worry, just ask it a question. <laughs> and it starts to, like she said, outline everything, like the structural thinking. The funny thing about it is that chat GPT itself doesn't even know how powerful it is. Like it'll tell you all the backwards routes, like the highly technical routes for like weighted calculations. And then if you use a GPT plugin, you'll just say, just analyze it for me and it'll give you the sentiment without you having to do all these weights and things like that which is so hilarious because but i think we, if i can just say Andrew, you know what would be interesting <laughs> is to get a group of people like who have the tech skills and then other people like myself who has who have communication skills together yeah so that because like if i were to to me it's it's daunting to say, okay, tell me how to do, you know, start me, start. Cause I, I feel like there's a say, there's a four questions in the Passover Seder and there's the, the son, always a son who doesn't know what questions to ask. So, mm -hmm. you know, but in some kind of collaboration, I would see what the questions are and I have other things and Jennifer would have other things and Tanya with her, you know, we'd all have different things to bring to that, to the table. It's all in the prompt. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. It's all in the prompt. Would, would it be one day we're gonna see like a little book or an app where we can look up the prompt? Because oh, yeah. I, because people that's what are I'm writing that I'm sure. Or I mean, there are people I'm seeing. Talk, you know, there are threads how to ask. You know, how to ask what you need, but not necessarily like to create what what you're talking about. Uh, well, so I'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Rose, I'll be happy to okay. uh, to help you. And also, there's a lot of spaces uh, that allow uh, um, for this kind of interaction. Zen is one of those people. He has had 560 spaces on Twitter Who in how to use it. Zen, yeah. yeah. No, I and uh, when he first, his first space I was in. I, he's a driver oh, yeah. RV. He's great. And it's like it's awesome. And the. Uh, like, and there are others, and you can find some of those. Uh, but even I, I, I'll help uh, uh, get anybody started. That's why I created that uh, Discord server as well, uh, so we can jump in and do the mentoring. And I'm envisioning essentially a, a metaverse, like a, essentially a, a room where everybody can jump in and book time and either collaborate with a bot or with a human, uh, whoever you feel the most comfortable, to, to teach you how to do things. Because you can... Uh, 
uh, you can do so much uh, more now. You can ask ChatGPT to help you hack your favorite re uh, re recipe. How I, I cook this that way? How can I improve it? And then try it and see maybe together you make a better cook or maybe <laughs> together you choose the wine better. I think there's all sorts of different uh, ways that uh, those who have, who are more experienced can already see them because we are, uh, we have broken down barriers and we have done all the other things and we want to show you these uh, experiences and uh, it, we want to build also the technology to, to allow this to happen naturally not only in these small groups uh, on Twitter or somewhere else but push that to to be how kids learn how kids uh, innovate in school push that to be how uh, adults innovate in the workforce when they are trying to retrain and allow community-based learning that allows to create and innovate because soon enough you won't be teaching um, um, facts or uh, things that are patterns you'll be teaching people your ideas your style your application your scope and this will take time and this will take place and if you uh, if we approach it from the same way that we've always approached technology and science we are just going to create silos and and that's going to create a worse experiences and worse technology. But if we all come together and, and drive to do, do exactly what you said, Rose, and come and have the technical and the non-technical, the low level, high level, the executives, the non-executives, single, uh, the, the people who are getting in, the QA, everybody, the content makers, so we can learn from each other and boost each other creativity because together we are going to create experiences for each other, not just for a specific subset of uh, fields or groups or uh, interactions or processes. I think this is the technology, how it's changing, and this is what we need to do next. Otherwise, um, we are going to miss the opportunity to establish the, the, the fields of science that belong in between, between technology and people, the psychology aspects, the philosophy aspects, the ethics, the governance, the um, human-centric uh, designs. And uh, I, who better to do it than uh, we have already started, I guess. <laughs> so Maria was asking about show notes, and I just wanted to give a quick answer. Maria, take your podcast episode and put it into Script or Otter or wherever. Take that raw transcript, put it into Chat GPT or GPT-4, and ask it to create your show notes and just give it the specifics. And if you have a show note style, what you want to do is you want to give it the examples. Here's the previous examples of show notes. Please format it in this way using this transcript. And voila. You're done. Show notes done. Thank you, Jennifer. That's actually, I love good actionable advice like that too. You ladies have been incredible of giving such amazing resources and actions and next steps and, and useful information tonight. And I'm sorry. Don't forget we have two more questions. That's it. I know. Well, that's, and I'm saying we're, we, we got to wrap it up. So the two questions that are left actually do kind of wrap into one another. So the last question that I have for everybody as we wrap up today is in like one sentence, a quick answer, because I know people have to head out. Where do you see AI going over the next three years capability-wise? What are your biggest hopes about the future of like benefits of AI and, and where do you see all of this taking us? Um, and let's go ahead, Sibylla, if you want to start. Yeah, uh, well, there are some quite a lot of uh, exciting opportunities happening some of it is with the uh, uh, government gpt type of solutions where we are trying to improve processes and hopefully improve experiences as well for the sake of everybody uh, and this uh, type of uh, effort is uh, uh, it's it's exciting and I have uh, as Sage is one of the ones that I can think of, Nicholas Chayon has been a uh, driving force in the cybersecurity and uh, in, uh, bringing agility to to public sector, to the DOD space, to uh, various areas and for those people who are concerned about the privacy aspect or the, um, the other aspects of working with classified information. These are patterns that are being worked with engineering teams to set up the various aspects of how systems like that would be created so they are uh, able to be used uh, with the security in mind and the zero trust and various aspects that uh, you need in order to be able to uh, use these systems in, in those environments. From public perspective, I think uh, the, the, I think 
the sky is the limit, really. I hope we see something that uh, brings everybody together on a global level, like Olympics, like digital Olympics, where we can um, we can compete uh, and showcase innovation and creation and capabilities uh, in a digital space. Uh, like we have always done in the physical spaces because this will give us a pulse on how the technology is developing and which are the countries leading in what aspects and what are the various uh, uh, systems or processes or uh, products or even platforms that work and we have uh, we have left that kind of to the sides there are a lot of various uh, events uh, industry events but there isn't really anything that is uh, globally uh, available for everybody to see, to aspire, for kids to, to want to learn. And when we ask how do we get more females to get into that industry, we need to bring more light to what is possible, what is the life of those people who are there, and how basically have people be able to imagine themselves uh, dreaming uh, themselves in these kind of tracks and it's not going to happen in the darkness in the shadows uh, we need to to create uh, uh, perhaps the next reboot uh, reboot the reboot series and uh, this time with uh, AI uh, generated a mid journey and teach the next generation how those systems work how the data and AI uh, age is going to uh, to be shaped in technology as well as uh, sociology perspectives Thank you. Um, Jennifer or Andrea, if you want to give us your uh, take on where AI is going for the future. Uh, sure. I mean, my hope, I think, is honestly that AI makes us faster, frees up more of our time, we can focus on solving big problems, you know, and I mean problems like homelessness and poverty and things like that. So if AI can help us do the things that previously we used to take up all of our time and energy and then usher into usher into, the, into a world where we can focus on solving huge problems because we have this dual mind now, essentially working in our favor. We can really work together to solve those big problems and, you know, help eliminate poverty, you know, help eliminate hunger, um, help teach, give everyone around the world equal education, equal, equal opportunity, you know? So, I feel like AI is on the path where it will eliminate a lot of the mundane tasks that don't necessarily meet us. So that's my hope. Anyway, um, solve bigger problems because we can. So, yeah. Thank you. And Jennifer, yours? So I'm going to give some actionable things um, because we're talking to PR and communications professionals. So what are some things that are actionable for you or for your clients or for the projects that you want to work on or for your organizations? If we look, if we take a clue or a hint at what uh, organizations like Bloomberg are doing, right? They use the API and they create, they trained it on their own content and then said, now we have this product that we can sell that goes with our Bloomberg terminal and it's a service or whatever they're going to do with that. If we take that as a clue, we all know that our clients have brand standards. We have brand standards. How many times do you get somebody who writes something or who doesn't do it correctly because maybe they're new or maybe they're an intern and you're like, look, we have this brand standards book, which is like this thick and it's a PDF of so many pages. And think about being able to take the API and train your client's version of the communications, but for the brand standards, very specific. Because then from now on, every single time you want to create content, you run it through the brand standards for the client's GPT, and it's going to make sure that everything adheres to what the 